Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Spivak, and I am the Marketing and Sales Manager for the Energy Conservatory. Uh, and I've been with the Energy Conservatory uh, since 1999. So with that, we'll start in on our discussion of the evolution of pressure gauges. The first thing to discuss is let's have a common understanding of what is pressure. Um, we'll discover, we'll cover some of the liquid instruments that are used to measure pressure, some of the mechanical instruments that are used, um, how electrical resistance came to the rescue to create a digital instrument. And then we'll talk a little bit about the electronic and digital instruments that are used for measuring pressure. So let's start off with uh, what is pressure, and we'll cover things like pressure terminology, uh, definitions of pressure, uh, origins of pressure. So with that, let's talk a little bit about different kinds of pressure. Certainly there's pressure that um, is experienced in a lot of different events, like the pressure at a dam, the water pressure in a house. And there's the fun kind of pressure, but it's still pressure where um, creating a force and uh, in order to hit the bell or win a prize. And there's pressure washers, your blood pressure, and then there's wind pressure. And of course, we can't forget about some of the everyday pressures that we all have to uh, experience. But what we're going to talk about is pressure as it relates to the house or building. And we're talking about uh, room pressures, uh, pressures measured with a blower door uh, or with an HVAC system that's on uh, measuring pressure from room to room uh, or from room to outside. So let's cover a little bit of the basic terminology of pressure. Um, and some of this is taken from the most recent version of ASHRAE 41.3, uh, which is the standard method of uh, pressure measurement uh, that was uh, just came out last year. But there's different kinds of pressure, and some of this relates to what we're talking about when we're doing blower door and duct blaster testing. So first off is absolute zero, which is the complete absence of pressure. Uh, that's what's in outer space. We don't experience that here, but that's the floor of all pressure measurements. And everything when we're measuring from absolute zero is an absolute pressure value. Then there's the ambient pressure, which is what we mostly deal with in that it's around us and uh, it affects our everyday life. When we attach a gauge to that and we measure compared to the uh, surroundings, then that's considered a gauge pressure or a negative pressure, or vacuum pressure. So comparisons to the ambient pressure, those are important values and fit into this whole pressure scheme. Now you'll notice that differential pressure sits off to the side because it's not really in the scale of absolute or ambient pressure. It's just measuring the difference between two points. Uh, and part of that you experience when you're doing a blower door or duct blaster test, or even just a room to room pressure. We don't care about necessarily the surroundings or the ambient pressure. We wanna know what's the pressure in this room with respect to that room. So further on with the definitions of pressure, pressure is that uh, normal force per unit area exerted by a fluid on a containing wall with respect to a reference. So one of the things that we should always remember is that air is a fluid. And so that fluid has mass and density, and therefore that has an effect on uh, a containing wall. The containing wall could be the house, could be the uh, ductwork, but that's what we're talking about when we're dealing with pressure. 
So then here's some of the others that we just talked about. So absolute pressure is the normal force of unit with respect to zero absolute pressure. Ambient pressure is the pressure at which a device operates. So wherever you're at, that's the ambient pressure. And gauge pressure is usually referred to as measuring something above or below that. So for example, if you were measuring tire pressure, you would read that, uh, the, technically you would read that in PSIG. So it's um, pressure with respect to the ambient or surrounding area of the tire versus the inside of the tire. Then the differential pressure is just the difference between any two points. Now, some of the pressure definitions that uh, we talk about on a regular basis when we're dealing with HAC systems or houses and the like is total pressure, static pressure, and velocity pressure. Now, total pressure, and this is usually in the context of ductwork. So, total pressure is that pressure value that is on a plane normal to the local flow direction. So if you have a piece of ductwork that's going from left to right, the pressure that's moving from left to right is referred to as total pressure. Static pressure is that pressure that's on a plane perpendicular to the local flow direction. So if you have ductwork going from left to right and air is moving from left to right, the static pressure is really going to be the pressure value coming at you or away from you or up and down. Now when we measure both of those, the total pressure and the static pressure, and have a device that is used to measure the difference between those, that's known as velocity pressure. So it's the net effect between total and static pressure. And usually this uh, value of velocity pressure is limited by the gauge that's being used in how much uh, is being displayed, how accurately and with what resolution can we measure uh, both the total and the static pressure. So let's talk a little bit about liquid instruments. Uh, and part of that is the origins of pressure measurement. So within the origins of pressure measurement is a man by the name of Evangelista Torricelli. Uh, he was the person that's credited with developing the barometer. And as part of his name, Tor, that has been a unit of uh, pressure measurement for many, many years. Once the metric system fully kicked in, Tor has not really been used very often, but you'll hear people uh, mention that every once in a while. So Tor uh, is developed from Torricelli uh, in 1644. So this is a picture uh, of a typical uh, barometer. Now, a lot of times it's been updated over the years, but the fluid here obviously is mercury, we're not using mercury anymore, um, but the idea is that there is a tube with a vacuum and the amount of atmospheric pressure affects a fluid such as the mercury reservoir and pushes the value up into the vacuum tube. So this is the basic understanding of, uh, of pressure that uh, began in the mid-1600s. After that is Pascal, and Pascal is credited with the understanding that pressure is evenly distributed in a vessel. So if you think of a house as that vessel, his theory is such that when pressure is introduced, it will evenly be distributed throughout the house. Now, obviously in today's construction, when we have multi-floors and we have impediments between the floors such as fire doors and the like that is a difficult concept to understand but if all of the doors were open and all of the obstructions were removed then uh, someone could see that on the 10th floor versus the first floor they're the same pressure 
when pressure is introduced into that building. The next guy is Christian Huygens. And he is credited with the development of the U-tube manometer uh, in 1661. And the idea here uh, with the U-tube manometer is that instead of having one of the tubes completely closed off, like the barometer, where it's a vacuum tube, it's sealed on one end, the U-tube manometer is actually open on both ends. And by placing a scale and then exerting uh, some pressure on one side of the tube, we can see and measure the difference of that level and that gives us the idea of, uh, of, of pressure. It gives us a value. So the original idea of the phrase inch of water column is derived from the YouTube manometer. So when we measure one inch of water column, that means within the YouTube is water, pressure is applied to one side, and has adjusted the level by one inch. So it's a very literal phrase uh, when we talk about inches of water. Um, also when we get to uh, commercial buildings and many times when they are working on systems with um, hydraulic, hydronic systems and they're talking about feet of water column. Um, that's the idea. If you could set up a liquid YouTube manometer where the uh, measurement value were marked off in feet, it would be the same effect. Obviously, it would be really difficult to have a gauge, a liquid filled gauge, that's measuring in feet of water column. So, other advances needed to be uh, used. So, instead of water, when you use a heavier substance for the fluid, then you can get a corresponding difference because now something is more dense than water and therefore is more difficult to move based on pressure. A variation on the U-tube manometer is the incline manometer because obviously when you have only a single inch to work with, on a YouTube manometer, it's really difficult to see what the values are. So it was eventually developed to have an incline manometer so that as the pressure uh, increased or decreased in that tube, instead of being straight vertical, it was now inclined so that you could create larger uh, hash marks and truly you have a better understanding of what is uh, my pressure reading. So you'll see the incline tube manometers tend to be in uh, less than an inch of water column. Uh, and that's how the YouTube uh, manometer evolved into an incline tube manometer. The last person I want to talk about is Daniel Bernoulli. Uh, Bernoulli uh, is generally credited with the idea that his theory is what makes airplanes get off the ground. And the idea is that as there is an increase in the speed of the fluid, then simultaneously there is a decrease in, in pressure. So when it's applied to the wing of an airplane, uh, as the speed of the wing goes across uh, the runway, there is a decrease in the pressure beneath it, and that's what gives an airplane lift. But this is also true when it comes to ductwork, because as pressure uh, decreases, we get more flow. So let's talk a little bit about mechanical instruments. Liquid instruments are good, but they have a limited range of where they can be used and how they can be used. And so over time, there have been developments called the Bordon tube, there's bellows, diaphragms, and what a lot of people in our industry are familiar with is magnahelic gauges. Let's talk about the Bordon tube. 
The board on tube is um, exactly what it's talking about. It's a tube that is sealed on one end and open on the other where pressure is introduced. Um, it's much like the same idea as when you turn the faucet on for a hose uh, outside. And the hose might be curled up. And once you turn the water on in a high enough pressure, the uh, hose actually straightens out. The pressure inside the hose is forcing the uh, tube to go straight. So the board on tube is designed so that when pressure is applied to the tube itself, the tube extends. We can then attach a mechanical linkage system with a pointer and that gives the scale. So the idea of a board on tube is Higher pressure means a straighter tube gives us a higher value. A variation on that is a bellows gauge, so that as pressure is applied, as you can see at the bottom there, pressure is applied into a piston area, and as that area fills up, the bellow compresses the compression of that uh, bellow is linked to a mechanical mechanism which is further linked to a uh, needle and a scale is created behind that so that when someone is exerting pressure the bellow uh, pushes up, moves the linkage and increases the scale. These are terrific ideas on uh, mechanical innovation way back when, so that we're able to read different uh, pressure values. Another idea of a mechanical gauge is the diaphragm gauge, where as the pressure comes in, it fills up a diaphragm capsule at the bottom. As the capsule expands, that's linked to a pointer as well. And the pointer will then, as the uh, capsule increases, then these are useful um, conditions. So for example, the board on tube, the bellows, and the diaphragm gauge are really useful when it's always a positive pressure. Negative pressures are really difficult in order to do that because in this case, you would be collapsing the diaphragm and that's really difficult to do. So these are always associated with positive pressures and uh, a lot of times these are used for process piping and the like because we're dealing with a higher pressure value uh, where refinement of, of areas of less than an inch of water column aren't necessary. In this case we're dealing with 50 psi, 100 psi, 1000 psi and the like. So these are useful instruments for uh, commercial applications. The difficulty then is how do we measure in a mechanical form, how do we measure low pressures? Well, that then leads us to the development of the magnahelic gauge uh, by Dwyer Instruments. Uh, Dwyer many, many years ago, uh, this is in the uh, 1910s and 1920s, uh, was one of these, it was a, a company that was able to take the idea of a uh, diaphragm, which is the uh, item you see on the right hand side of the uh, cutaway housing. That diaphragm is then connected to a helical coil, which is what you see in the yellow circle. So as the diaphragm uh, it has pressure exerted on it, the helical coil then moves, which is linked to the, uh, which is linked to the pointer. So the idea here is now we're able to get into much smaller pressures of measurement. And these are done by varying the uh, diaphragm size, material, um, how 
elastic is it, things like that. So these are all in that general area. So the mechanical age, uh, the magnahelic is one where it was specifically adapted for lower pressure values. Now one of the difficulties of a magnahelic gauge is that uh, it's open to the atmosphere on both sides and one must always zero out the, uh, the gauge in order for it to read properly. And that's done with a uh, screwdriver and adjusting the uh, needle on the scale to zero. So the limitations are both liquid and mechanical gauges work really well for many industrial applications. Um, combinations of the liquid, uh, the mechanical movement, uh, material of the, of the uh, insides uh, provide really wide ranges of uh, applications. Both liquid and mechanical gauges need to be viewed. They're real time. Uh, so you need to be there in front of that gauge to see that value uh, to get a reading. But adding a digital display or storing data needed something extra. So we get to a point in time in history where evolution has uh, been able to create a whole variety of pressure measurement devices, but now we need to wait for the rest of the world to catch up. So here's where we'll move on into talking about electrical resistance to the rescue. We'll talk a little bit about the Wheatstone Bridge strain gauge and piezoelectric effect. Now, you might be saying to yourself, why is this guy talking to us about electrical circuits? The idea here is that the Wheatstone Bridge uh, was first developed in 1833 and eventually became popularized in, uh, by improving on it by a guy named Wheatstone in 1843. The idea here was Wheatstone was trying to measure some soil conditions and had a very difficult time trying to come up with something. He viewed the development by Christie and saw that he could take a variety of resistors of known values, have one of them change, and that creates an electrical circuit. So now we're getting into an area where, oh, I can actually see electrically what's going on. So from that, the Wheatstone Bridge actually has been used to uh, be incorporated in a lot of, of instruments. Wheatstone Bridge is found in resistance thermometers, uh, hot wire anemometers, uh, and strain gauges. Now, strain gauge is a variation on a pressure measurement. So, when we look at a diagram of strain gauge, you can see that on one leg of the Wheatstone Bridge, there is a series of wires on some sort of surface. As pressure is applied to that surface, the change in electricity takes place. So now we can take the idea of force or pressure as it's hitting an electrical circuit, and now we can actually measure that. So from this, one of the things that we're able to do is using the Wheatstone Bridge on one leg laid on a surface, when force is applied to the surface, there's a change in resistance. The change in resistance is calibrated against other means of measuring force. So for example, you could take the values measured, because uh, a strain gauge is generally higher pressures, you could use the strain gauge and compare that to, say, a boron tube, to a U-tube manometer, and compare the pressure values that are experienced on one and calibrate that and compare that 
to that being experienced by the strain gauge. Once you have a comparison, you are now calibrated, and now we can take the strain gauge and measure pressure. So I hope that makes sense to everyone because it's a, it's we're mixing in other technologies in order to get to an electrical measurement. Because the electrical measurement is what's really setting us up for uh, using pressure measurement to read very low uh, pressures and airflows. So I'm combining a series of um, mechanical and electrical experiments that have taken uh, hundreds of years to develop. To develop. Um, so I'm going to mix in another concept, which is the pyroelectric effect. Uh, this is this was understood by Linnaeus and others, and it was determined, they were able to determine that temperature can affect the electrical generating properties of materials. They didn't know exactly what to do with this, but they knew that when uh, temperature was applied to certain metals, then they would get a different electrical charge or property from those different metals. And it was a correlation of how much temperature then moved over to uh, how much electrical charge. So a lot of this resulted in the idea of uh, electrical uh, temperature measurements. And there are a lot of different when we look at, at uh, pyrometry and temp high temperature measurement, there's a lot of materials that are used for various ranges on whether it's a uh, thermistor to measure household temperature or to measure uh, inside the exhaust of uh, an 8,000 horsepower diesel engine. Certain properties of the material used to measure generate certain electrical circuits uh, that are measurable. All we need to do is connect those to a gauge. So others experimented with the relationship between electrical charge and mechanical stress. So now hopefully you'll see the connection between this. So now we have electrical charge uh, properties and now we have mechanical stress and electrical charge. This resulted in the piezoelectric effect. So from all of these other experiments, the Curie brothers, this, these are the sons of Madame Curie, combined their knowledge of the pyroelectric effect with the underlying structure of crystals. So once we see a series of crystals and we put them under force, we can see an electrical charge change. So hopefully this little simplified uh, diagram at the bottom is showing you what that means. Because piezoelectric sensors are what's used in today's modern pressure instruments. So last, these experiments remain in the laboratory. Basically an answer to a question that was not asked yet. So the world had to wait for other electrical and electronic components to catch up to the general idea of what's being, um, how to take this experiment uh, and actually make something real out of it. So now we're moving to electronic and digital instruments. We'll talk about the piezoelectric devices, sensors, um, So piezoelectric devices, the first uh, known practical application of a piezoelectric device was developed uh, as a way to uh, be used for sonar. So the very first submarines in the early 1900s had a sonar. The idea was that there were crystals that were layered between two pieces of steel and an electrical measurement was was able to be connected to that and it detected the returning sound pressure wave. So when sonar is activated there's a ping, we're familiar with that in, in any of the uh, sea time dramas. The idea is that um, 
it's sending out a pressure, a sound wave is sending out, and that sound wave is pressure. So sonar measures how much pressure is being returned. So as the pressure is affecting this uh, combination of crystals and metal, an electrical charge is returned. The strength of the electrical charge was what determined how far away um, the reflected material was um, that the sound was sent to. So in the underwater world, sending out an electrical signal, or sending out a sound signal, and getting it back. If you didn't get a sound wave back, there was nothing there. The further away it is, the longer it took to come back, and the lower the pressure value that was experienced. So after this, once this was um, deployed in a real-world application of piezoelectric devices, um, the adaptation into other electronic, uh, or other applications soon followed. Now from that, we can get smaller and smaller sensors developed. The world developed smaller and smaller computers and processors. So the idea is that we're getting a convergence of all of these variety of ideas. We have pressure measurement, we have a way to measure pressure, we have uh, components coming together to create a device. So this is a cutaway of what might be a typical uh, piezoelectric sensor. The idea here is that a material, this thin diaphragm you see on the top part here, there's a thin diaphragm that's going across an element. The resistors, the piezo resistor devices are connected to that diaphragm. And as, in looking at the bottom diagram, as external pressure is exerted onto that very simple diaphragm, that changes the electrical value of that material. So here we have, we're measuring it with the Wheatstone Bridge. That's why you see there's four sensors here. Those Wheatstone Bridge is across a tensile material as pressure is exerted, you get a value. The nice thing about a piezoelectric sensor in that it is uh, captured inside of a box, essentially. So when we connect uh, pressure ports to either side, we can get pressure values of one way or another. So positive pressure would be you would see the diaphragm deflected up, and negative pressure would be deflected down. The nice, the really nice part about this is that the entire electrical value of that is known, so that when we go up or down, we can see that change in electricity. And as we see that change in electricity, it tells us whether it's positive or negative pressure. So the characteristics of a piezoelectric sensor is uh, crystals, diaphragm, and electrical leads. They're all the essential parts of what makes up a sensor. The crystal material, the thickness of the diaphragm, and the circuitry combine in a variety of ways to provide sensors that have different ranges and different sensitivities. So therefore, we can have a pressure sensor that reads zero to one inch, or zero to one foot, or zero to one pound, or zero to a thousand pounds, based on what type of material is being used. So it's a very flexible way of coming up with a variety of different uh, pressure measurements. Now, as you might suspect, they can be subject to orientation. So the deflection of the diaphragm from horizontal to vertical uh, to opposing horizontal can change the electrical value. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you have the uh, gauge sitting horizontal on a table, the diaphragm that's in there is all set to read zero. When you tip the gauge vertically so that it's standing on end, 
the weight of the diaphragm and everything connected with it changes. So when that happens, we need to understand the orientation because it can affect how the uh, pressure sensor responds. The simplest thing is whether the pressure sensor is turned upside down or not. Because now we have, even though it's a very small amount of weight, there is a weight change and that can affect the values uh, that we see. So here's some examples of uh, piezoelectric sensors. Those of you who might have been customers of the Energy Conservatory for a number of years are familiar with the DG3. Uh, the sensor on the left hand side is that of uh, a DG3. The pressure, pressure sensor on the right hand side is that of the DG700. So you can see that there is a significant difference in the size and mass uh, associated with a standard uh, electrical sensor. And you can see as a reference that in the background is just a standard AA battery. So there has been um, a huge uh, advantage in decreasing the size of the sensor in order to read the same values. So the pressure on the left, or the sensor on the left, and the sensor on the right read exactly the same pressure values. They have the same ranges. So while we still have smaller packages, they still have the same issues regarding orientation that take effect. So we need to watch out for that as we're using a gauge. Sensors also, one of the things about uh, pressure measurement is that pressure is very uh, susceptible to changes in temperature. So the smaller package, while it's more desirable for packaging and we can get it in there into a gauge, a smaller and smaller gauge, it's now actually more susceptible to various fluctuations of temperature inside the gauge. The sensor on the left hand side has a great deal more mass, so any temperature that could be affecting that will uh, take longer to have a true effect on the values. Whereas on the right hand side, now we have a much smaller body to deal with and now we have to uh, consider what the internal temperature gains of the gauge are. So here's an experiment. I'm hoping this shows up. a short video uh, that doesn't seem to want to show up. We did an experiment. So let me try and walk you through what this experiment is. We took a two quart mason jar and we sealed the jar completely. The jar has a pressure tap on the on the top of the uh, container. The hose is connected to the digital gauge. When you take two hands and you surround the two quart jar with your hands, the pressure value that's that's uh, red on the gauge actually increases. So by placing your hands on the glass jar it has such an effect that it will just automatically increase the temperature. But it's experienced as a change in pressure value. So it's an interesting experiment. I was hoping it would be able to show up uh, more evidently on here. Um, but unfortunately, it's not uh, doesn't show up. Let's see if we can get that on the on the uh, website. So, what that experiment, uh, along with the discussion of the orientation of the gauge, 
leads to is that in order to have uh, a really accurate and stable reading, auto zero valves are employed. So on the left hand side, because that was uh, the DG3 was done many, many years ago, that's the diagram or that's the actual picture of the auto zero valve. In the DG700, you can see on the right hand side, uh, that's an auto zero valve. We're able to reduce the package size, but we still need to have an auto zero valve to help us adjust for the uh, orientation of the gauge, as well as the temperature gains or changes that affect that. So by uh, auto zeroing frequently, and, it's, and what we do on the DG700 is approximately once every 10 seconds or so, that no matter how the orientation is uh, applied to the gauge or how long you've been holding it, the auto zero valves negate the artificial changes in pressure due to things that aren't actually being measured, such as the pressure in the house or uh, against the fan and the like. So here's the, here's the everything kind of packaged together inside of a DG700. So you see uh, on the top part the two pressure sensors, because uh, the DG700 has two independent channels. The original DG3 had a single channel, uh, and you had to switch the channel selector from one side of the gauge to the other. So each of those pressure, independent pressure channels now have auto zero valves. To have the uh, to have a DG3 that would have actually two auto zero valves with the two sensors, that would take up an awful lot of internal real estate. So the auto zero valves take care of uh, the various effects that relate to temperature change as well as orientation. So you can see that we have um, the pressure ports are indicated on the lower part, and we have very small tubing, uh, very low volume, that goes from uh, each of the pressure uh, ports to the various uh, pressure sensors. So what happens over time, obviously, we advance in our ability to create um, smaller and more advanced electronics. So for example, the image on the left hand side is the production board of a DG700. The big square um, item that's uh, just below the top is the uh, processor that's used in the DG700. So you can see that we still have a lot of available real estate in a DG700. On the right hand side is the internals of uh, our new gauge, the DG1000. And I show this because in the center of the gauge is actually a uh, computer operating chip and operating system. So we've gone from just having a very simple microprocessor to uh, more advanced uh, computer controls. And you can see that now we have um, the auto zero valves are hidden there on the back side of the board of the DG1000. But we have all of the pressure ports uh, going to the auto zero valves and then also to the pressure uh, sensors. And the pressure sensors are underneath this uh, metal shield. The metal shield is there to keep out interference from uh, electromagn uh, electromagnetic activity or radio interference. So as we come up with more uh, functions and more features, we have more electronics. And it gets uh, more crowded, and uh, but it provides more functionality. But you can see here, so no matter what's uh, involved in the electronics, the main part in the heart of a solid accurate measurement 
is the combination of the pressure uh, sensor, the zero valves, uh, to the pressure ports. And this is our pressure engine. So the pressure engine on the left-hand side is that for the DG1000, and the pressure engine on the right-hand side is that of the DG700. So to kind of um, wrap things up a little bit, one of the things is the evolution of pressure gauges as it's been experienced by our company. So on the far left-hand side is the, in 1983 when the Energy Conservatory first started, we used magnetic gauges, mainly because creating an electronic uh, device was hardly practical for a brand new company. And it, we had readily available devices, such as the Magna Helix, to read low pressure values when we're talking about 50 pascals and 25 pascals. Um, it works pretty well. Around 1993 was the development of the DG2 and 3. In 2004 was the development of the, of the DG700, and now uh, in the very near future, uh, we have the uh, DG1000 coming out soon. So you can see the change in, uh, in technology uh, basically in just a 30-year span on how uh, pressure measurements have changed over the years. And when you look at the industry as a whole, you see a lot of um, different measurement uh, techniques and different instruments. Uh, with lots of different functionalities um, and how they operate. Uh, so here is just a selection of the various gauges that, uh, that exist out there um, and have existed for, for some time. And the evolution of pressure gauges uh, continues. We're at a point where sensor development um, might be at a diminishing return. It depends on how small they can actually make them. Um, and so the change is how do we actually read them? So the pressure values are still there, but how do we read them? What's involved inside the gauge? So these are the various uh, functions that uh, have changed over time and may uh, be our, what's our our limit on how far we can go. Uh, we can get pre better and better uh, pressure measurements, but getting smaller and smaller values is more difficult. So now we have to work on the refinement of the measurement process, and that comes in using more advanced electronics. So that is essentially the uh, conclusion of the evolution of digital pressure gauges. Hopefully this was worthwhile for you um, to give you a little perspective on the fact that pressure measurements are, are uh, 400 years old and we're still learning things as we move along. So we did have a couple of, pressure, a couple of questions. I wanna see if I can uh, answer those. Uh, one is what's the type of pressure sensor used in very low air pressure applications? Um, and that's really the piezoelectric sensors. The uh, other forms of, of measurement are really for higher pressure values. So we're getting smaller and smaller pressure values. The piezoelectric sensors are really uh, the only way to, uh, to read that. Um, so there's a question about the orientation of, of uh, the gauge, and that certainly is uh, taken care of by auto zero valves. Auto zero valves are, are used, and there are some instruments, there are some pressure instruments that don't have auto zero valves. Those tend to be instruments where the pressure value is higher, and so small differences in temperature orientation is kind of unimportant to the overall measurement process. So auto zero valves may not be employed on higher pressure values. Uh, 
Uh, one of the questions is, what's the button battery in the DG1000? Uh, that's basically to hold, uh, hold memory, uh, hold all of the values over time. Uh, we'll be talking more about uh, the DG1000 as an instrument uh, in the very near future. Hopefully, by the uh, at the end of the month, we'll be making some announcements as to a final introduction date, when people can order, and when people can expect to get them. Uh, question is, what has to be recalibrated? The whole idea, what has to be calibrated, is the sensor itself. The electronics can only do so much to um, smooth out the electrical signal. So the recalibration is done because what we've experienced is that the uh, sensor material, whether it's a sensor material or the electronics, something about the pressure sensor, we know that after approximately two years, they have an internal drift meaning that on January 1st of 2016, they read zero, and on January 1st, 2018, they could be reading three, four, or five pascals instead of, what, instead of actually zero. So the idea there is that you recalibrate them. Basically, you change the, the formula uh, and the various offsets to that material and bring it back into a proper uh, alignment for calibration, what we call calibration. And that's, so we're affecting the pressure sensor itself to be recalibrated. Um, Someone using other manufacturer's equipment, how do I determine which orientation the gauge should be in? The advent of any gauge that has a um, auto zero valve, it doesn't really matter what the orientation is as you get started. Once you start taking readings, as long as the orientation is, is uh, uh, fixed, so for example, on a blower or a test, it might be attached to the door, uh, and the gauge then is completely vertical, as long as it stays there while you're taking the measurement, then the orientation really shouldn't matter. What you want to avoid is as you start taking a reading, now you start moving the gauge around, and if you don't have it auto zero fast enough, then that orientation can affect the readings that you have. Excuse me. Um, question about the resolution of um, gauges at very low pressures. Uh, instrument variation versus smaller pressure differences. Uh, wind blowing on a reference tube. So there's a couple of different subjects there. The uh, resolution of an instrument is how many decimal places, um, either before or after, um, after 0.0, .0 .0 takes place. So is the gauge reading in one pascal increment or a tenth of a pascal instrument or hundredth of a pascal of it, uh, of increments? So resolution is important based on a scale. So when we're reading uh, 50 pascals, we believe it's nice to have a resolution of a tenth of a pascal so that you know that am I close to 50 or close to 49, because in some cases it can mean the difference between a building that passes uh, and a building that fails. So we want to see that value. But when we're dealing with trying to read 500 pascals, then it's not necessary to read tenth of, a, tenth of a pascal. So resolution is related to the range of measurement. So for example, a gauge that's going to be reading uh, 100 psi doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if they're reading a tenth of a PSI. Uh, that's a huge pressure value. So resolution is matched to the application that people uh, are using the device. So resolution is uh, something that when you're reading very, very low, then you want to get as much resolution as possible. Uh, tenth of a Pascal certainly 
Um, we've always experienced the with the idea of hundreds of a pascal, uh, but to a certain extent, you, you know, not necessary to get so far down um, to read a value. But when we're trying to read zero, you know, the better, the more resolution, uh, the better. Um, instrument variation versus small air pressure differences. Um, this is really where you have to judge by looking at the specifications for each of the instruments. What is, uh, where do they read? And reading the specifications in a way to say, is it a, a compound value of accuracy and resolution? Meaning, instead of just being plus or minus 3% or 1% of reading, is it plus or minus 1% of reading plus half a pascal? Um, is it 1% of scale instead of 1% of reading? Um, this is where you need to see the differences between the accuracy specifications and resolution of each of the instruments. Um, another question on wind blowing on a reference tube. Uh, because we're dealing with very low pressure values, uh, when there is crosswind against the uh, tube, it can have a, a very large effect on the building pressure. But that really does translate into the fact that if there's a large wind affecting the uh, open end of the tube that's outside, it's really also affecting the uh, building itself. So there's a lot of fluctuation there. We want to do as much uh, dampening of that value as possible, um, but sometimes trying to dampen it defeats the purpose of reading it. You dampen it so much that you can't actually read a number. So the idea is that we just want to uh, shield the open end of the tube that's outside from uh, cross measurements, cross winds. Uh, so for example, you don't want to put the outside tube in front of or at the exit of a blower door fan when you are depressurizing a building because now you have unintended wind going across the end of the sensor. That's why it's always recommended to take the outside tube and throw it off to the side away from the fans. Um, Question on when calibration is done, how many standard pressure pressures are used to calibrate? Uh, that is uh, entirely dependent on the, man, on the manufacturer. Uh, and I believe that we have uh, 12 pressure points, both uh, positive and negative on both sensors. Um, when an instrument is returned for calibration, we do an as-found uh, certificate, meaning Here's the status of the instrument as we found it, and then if it's uh, we do we do the recalibration anyways, even if it's close, we do the recalibration and provide another certificate uh, with the pressure values as it's been recalibrated. So the number of points um, also depends on how. What's the resolution or what's the range of the, of the instrument? So we always try to do zero, 25 pascals, 50 pascals, 100, 250, 500, and so on. Um, and it's about uh, 12, both positive and negative. Um, question is, when conducting a uh, combustion appliance zone test uh, and differential pressure test between a room and a house, uh, is it important to keep the DG upright during the test? Does orientation affect the, these readings? Yes, orientation does affect the readings. The uh, If you're walking, uh, if you're just carrying the gauge around the house and you want to do room pressure mapping or you just want to find out what the pressure is in the other room, just make sure that you're holding the instrument steady, that you're not twisting it while you're taking the reading. You can still be walking around with it, but you don't want it horizontal and vertical and do that every few seconds because now the reading could be changing. So that's uh, so orientation is really uh, can be effective, can be a factor when you're doing a handheld reading and you're walking around the house. 
for cast testing, usually people will um, have the gauge either sitting on the floor, or sitting on top of uh, uh, some other surface, or um, in the case of our, our new gauge where we have magnets on it, you can connect that and have it on the side of the water heater so that it really doesn't uh, change very much. And especially when we're doing cast testing, the, uh, we're dealing with, can be dealing with very low value. So we really don't want to be uh, moving the gauge around when it, when that takes place. Um, well, there's an interesting trivia question. I think we'll, an we'll end our session on this because I really don't have an answer, but they're really great questions. So the question is, how many lines of code, program code, are there in the firmware in the device like the DG700 or the DG1000, or both? Um, that's a fabulous question. I wish I had an answer to it. Uh, I know a lot of things, but I don't know that. So hopefully in the next session, when we do something, I think uh, we'll uh, provide some uh, some interesting trivia questions for that. Uh, so with that, uh, we are past our hour time frame, um, and hopefully this was a useful piece of information for you, and uh, maybe you can provide some trivia pieces of information to your homeowners when you're doing a test. Thanks a lot, everybody. If you do have some questions later on, send them off to me, uh, fspvac at energyconservatory.com or send them off uh, to editor at energyconservatory.com. Thank you very much.